All right, another log meeting here. Uh, some group updates. We have our GitHub account has been transferred or turned into a GitHub organization. So if anybody in this room would like to be, or anybody in Pro or whoever would like to be part of the organization so they can contribute to our repositories, do let us know. The organization gives us more uh, collaborative control. If we can put people on the team, we can assign teams to specific projects. So that helps a lot. And the other big thing is that um, in the past, there's when I want to go make a repository, so I'm going to have to log into the personal account for using uh, ECM blog and the password you had for it. But and then switch back to my point to use my name. But now in this organization, you create the repository as your your user and supply it or assign it to the organization, so it's still underneath the organization. Uh, our Zen project system is back up and uh, running. So we pulled out uh, two bad memory sticks, we pulled out both dams, and it's now back up. That's nice. So now we the uh, GitLab server is accessible, and it goes to the next bullet point here is that we do have a GitLab server. So if you go to git.gnulove.org, and we have our own personal system where you can actually have your own repositories and many private repositories as you, as you want. So we're going to be hosting all of our stuff from the two groups, OpenSM and Log, that um, we want things that are too confidential, like maybe it's just the configurations and stuff that we'll put in here and make them private. So if you would like an account, let us know. That way you don't have to pay for GitHub or whoever else. You can post it with us. Um, Links in the news, not a whole lot here. Uh, Ubuntu, there's probably plenty, but it's all I came up with. Ubuntu 14.04.2 released. You can get the ISO, has a new X stack, and uh, a current new kernel for like, two big updates to work with it. Um, GDB 7.9 was released. We're actually in debugging. I think it now has more of a better scripting language as well with that release. Uh, going right into Education Epoch, where we talk about uh, education resources. So the VimL primer book just came out a month ago or so, and um, it's, a, it's a book on Vim scripting. It's actually pretty uh, short, like 92 pages or something. But the author of it I got in contact with, he gave me a free copy. My goal, or what I had to do, was just, I had to review it whenever I finished the book, but it looks like he may actually give a copy to everybody in luck. So, so free ebook, ebook. So, um, if anybody's interested in that, let me know. Um, Lucian, I'm hoping you'd be interested in this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I figured you would. So, uh, we'll see how they go. I'm going to get back with me. She can talk to the publisher and see if we'll do that. So, um, moving into the talk period. Um, P-Trace, we did a P-Trace talk last time, and we're talking about a specific uh, Proxys uh, file called P-Trace Scope. And we want to zoom down here. I actually don't even remember what this did. I already forgot. Um, take a look here. Okay, so the control is whether you can actually P trace a child process or not based on your user level. So P trace directly from a parent to a child. You can use you or S trace you dash F. There's the root user. Ah, okay, sorry. So what this actually does is, uh, so P-Trace, or people are actual, uh, there's a system called, called P, or, uh, right here, PR Control, that, you, that a program is going to apply to the program and say, hey, you are either allowed or not allowed to P-Trace my application, and P-Trace thus means the use of S-Trace, S-Trace uses P-Trace in the kernel to actually lock on entry and exit of system call so it can record it. Um, and what actually this, this option doesn't this actually having to be able to do that in the programming language, you can control the behavior, behavior by this, this variable here, or this, this uh, proc file in the proc FS. And it says, um, so basically, if you want to attach to a process that's already running, this is, uh, you said, if it's set to one, you will not be allowed to do that. But so, for example, SSHD fork. So if you attach the S trace S trace SSH, uh, SSHD, and then just the F off, and actually trace all the all the fork processes underneath all the childs, 
then you'd be able to, able to do that from the command line, but you can't do that if one is set from the, if the process is actually running because the ptrace scope only works if you actually launch the parent and then you're tracing the child. So if the parent already, <laughs> running and the child already has child, you cannot walk into that and trace them. So that's missing with the ptrace scope variable control. Um, moving on, then for SVIC connection, uh, shell space. So uh, I did a 20% on this Melody Ness uh, search script I wrote a few years ago. I did an update to it uh, to the, earlier this week. Actually, over the weekend. And uh, I did a 20% performance increase um, by switching the use of the bash built in the brackets for testing, right? With the, what is a bash keyword, the double brackets, which is newer. And the difference is, besides that there's some uh, expressions, uh, pattern matching differences, uh, the, the big difference for the performance increase, though, was the fact that the double brackets does not spawn a new process every time it's called, but the single brackets do. So that's the, that call is the built in that actually spawns a new process every time a, a, a test is made. So let's actually go into the code here. Um, you can see it's real simple. So I had the, the single brackets. And all I did was change them to the double bracket. bracket. So I just added a, a bracket to each side, and that caused uh, by itself a 20% speed up in my program. Simply because every time you call the single bracket, they had to spawn a new process. In this case, it doesn't. And then now uh, J Justin Azoff for the routine uh, went into patch as well, and now there's a 100% performance increase because we're now using associated arrays. So instead of doing a linear search. Where I'm reading it through, matching all this, reading the next entry, matching now, reading the next entry, and see the matches and the other pieces of text. This is just IP and list and stuff. So here's the IP address in this list. I need to match it against my my uh, my row log or something, and then it reads through. This is actually going to flow through. It doesn't actually have to do that. We'll go through through multiple times. You just do it once, but it has to be stored all in a in a, in a, in a array. And you do one single pass through, and that was 100 percent before speed up. So just. Important to note, though, is that if you use the double bracket, you're, you lose POSIX compatibility. That's true. Yes. So make sure you call bin bash and not bin sh. Yes. Very good. Thank you. And I guess we can go ahead and demonstrate the uh, uh, use of that so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Um, so let's do. Um, see if I have anything more. Okay. So for I is go ahead and expand this to 1,000. Uh, do um, we're going to test for test for i here. Like done time. Let's, let's do your So that's a new process for every single one of those tests. In this particular case, we're just testing that i that there is a value for i that's there. You can see it took 10 seconds. Let's do it this way now. Five seconds, so half the time in this particular case, right? Simply because we don't have to spawn a new one every single time. And also note on Unix systems, uh, the older the history behind it, it used to be a program called test, right? That's in the old old Unix systems. Um, I guess system five, I think, or seven that came out with. Um, so you'd have to do you test your really test and you do uh, you know like a uh, bash or something, right? You test it that way. And if it exists, it's zero. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. Uh, so let's try one that does exist. Uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't exist. Distributor. Again, that's case of one now because that variable doesn't exist. But we're actually doing the same thing when we're doing this. So in this particular case, we're going to do home again. The home variable says, just to go completely through it, home is set to this, right? But if I want to test it, it, it prints it, it, it exits with a, a return code of zero. If that variable is set to a value, and you can see this here, it is. But it's not set to a value because we made it up, made up variable. See, there's nothing there. Then we do test again just one more time. And then we do made up. And then we check the editor code. And it's one because there's nothing there, nothing set. But at the same time, you can do this made up. 
and that returns one as well. But if it was home, it, the value is sent to my home directory, so that returns zero because it exists. The value is set. So um, you can actually you can actually see that there is a program for compatibility. They actually, if your if your shells didn't support it, they actually have a program called the bracket. It's literally the binary, the bracket. So let's do which. Right there it is. So look at that. Bin the bracket. That's a real program. So do, but whenever I'm doing it from bash, type, type, uh, actually I don't type uh, yeah, yeah, well, okay. So as a shell as a shell built in, you can see I'm actually not calling the program, but if I wanted to actually call that particular program, I could do it as well and do the uh, the test that way. So just a little bit of information on that. Um, Moving on to Container City. So this article came out recently, and it was really interesting. A guy is using Docker to run all of his applications from the desktop inside these Docker containers. And um, it's kind of cool. Uh, so he's just doing it for fun. So he's running this RC client inside a Docker container. And as you can see, there's what he's running. So he's, got, he's by mounting his RC configuration from the actual host inside the container. Setting it read only because you don't actually need to write anything to, to this in the file system there. Um, another one is using MUT. Here he's, he's by mounting his GPG key from the whole host, et cetera. Also, uh, setting the tire with local tire. Uh, I don't know what the hell Ravenwood stream is. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is right there. Clear okay. client. <laughs> so he's by mounting that, the stuff his configuration for that. I'll check that out. Uh, same with links. But he goes further he goes GUIs with X11 boarding. So in this case, he's Biden's running Chrome in a container just out in front of his desktop. And you can see that he's actually uh, by now, I think, the, the X11 sock, uh, unique socket on the machine so he can communicate with the host, right? Putting a display into variable and then just running uh, Chrome. And then here's the result. He's talking to this girl uh, through in a container that's presented on his host. So that's pretty cool. And if you want to actually get sound from the container to your host, you have to bind out the dev uh, sound device. So this, is, this is a pretty cool post. You get Spotify as well, and uh, a few other things. Uh, what is this one? Departed, partitioning program, Skype. Uh, I thought this is a really cool post. And Tor Browser in a container. So that's kind of nice. All right. So um, the next uh, item in the container city is uh, the addition and dropping of capabilities in the latest kernel for containers, but we'll talk about that at, towards the end because it's going to go right into my talk. Devin's here, uh, not here tonight, so we don't have to speak Does anybody else have anything? I have a strong one. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, ready for now? Yeah. All right. I was going to do a bit thing with libfti. Okay. Sounds good. Right. So. But I have to use my own hardware. This one then, so. Okay, gotcha. So if there's anyone on uh, Mostly, it's I mean, it was get five minutes of all of the video. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, some plug that we need. PDA. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <coughs> yeah, I can't wait to uh, Zoom. I can't wait until Zoom supports Linux. Yeah. So this is one, I guess I was pressing the escape key. I haven't really taught myself memory motion for this yet, but uh, or motor memory. But uh, you can actually instead of having to press escape key to exit normal mode, you can switch it with control uh, left bracket. Uh, so I'm typing something in insert mode, right? You see it. Oh wait, I'm not even plugging in. Whoops. So uh, you can 
use this right here to actually go to normal mode. All right, so I'm in insert mode right here. You can see insert at the bottom left. So I'm going to now press that, and I can now do stuff, right? So it just switches it out for me. Fairly simple. Insert this command. I can just normal mode commands, right? And this, uh, oh, okay. no. I would say this applies to any terminal program because the way the way the terminal escape sequences work, uh, for all it knows, you are pressing escape. It's just that's the sequence that it sends. So oh, that will uh, work with anything in the terminal. Nice. Do you have an example? Um, I can I can try to think of one. Let's see. Uh, I think in Bash, if you if you either hit escape or hold down escape, it asks you if you want to show all the completions or something. Oh, I've done that a long time ago, but that's not doing that for me right now. Because uh, you know how when you hit tab, like if you hit like, tab tab, it does that too. Right. Yeah. Pretty sure escape does that sometimes. And I know, uh, what is it, set dash O V I is a V I uh, input mode. Right. I can think of, unless you have like a specific uh, yeah, that's a good point. Based program or something. Right, that's a good point. Instead of setting it to V I, like my default to be max. Yeah. Let me try to do this in, in here. Uh, well, it's just the terminal thing, so. But yeah, I didn't know if it was OS 10 the version because I'm running running old version of Bash. Uh huh. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So that's good to know. I think. Um, cool. And then the other one we have is show compiled options in Vim. So side version at the bottom, right? It tells you all the options that Vim is compiled with. So if you need a specific thing, you can match it here. And you may have to recompile it or get a new package that has a specific feature if, you, if it doesn't have what you need. So, um, yeah. one, go ahead. Sorry. It's equivalent to the long form option dash dash version, too. If, so, if you don't want to open it, if you just want to, I don't know, call it from a script or something, you do dash dash version, it's the same output. Oh, nice. Thank you. We know about that one. Cool. Um, and then, one that I wanted to mention that I had uh, you can, there's one for pasting from your clipboard to Vim. And I would think it doesn't have support for it, um, but that'd be really nice to have instead of having to copy and paste it and then do my. And they never have that compiled in, in any of the binaries I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they don't. Yeah. But that's uh, that's a nifty one. And then same from bin to the to the host system's clipboard too. There's a register for that. Oh yeah. Yeah, you can paste it back in. Or no, under the support. But I think uh, for OS 10, you can get GVIN. I think it works that way. Yeah. But um, anyways, yeah. That's a little thing. Uh, the other I was going to talk about, I talked about it, or, well, <laughs> I talked about S trace last week, and um, I actually had an example of a real use case the day, like a few days later at work of using it to solve a problem. I don't have an extra step so I can replicate it, but um, essentially what happens is. So I was working on a system program called Sagan, the multi-threaded log analysis engine, and uh, it required some dependencies. One of the dependencies was liblog norm, and I created, I installed it, I created the package out of it, and then I transferred it to another Linux system, and installed the package uh, after I built it and all that. And so uh, it worked fine on this one system, not on that one. And uh, at the point is, whenever I ran Sagan, it would fail out. It says uh, the, the runtime linker would complain and say, um, you know, library not found. Okay. So um, what I had to do, well, I, I had to figure out why the hell wasn't it there because it was uh, the location, it was in the same location, the same the operating systems were the same. But uh, so whenever I, I ran the program, the runtime linker would go through all the libraries and look for a specific place. So I didn't actually know where it was looking for the, for the library, right, to load it. And it turned out that. It was in a location that's not enabled by default, or it's set by default in the runtime linker. So I actually had to manually put that in the, in L, uh, the LDSO cache and, and recompile that, uh, that that database, and then it worked fine. I guess I can kind of show them how much that probably sounds like a bunch of junk. Um, so anytime you open a program, like so, we're using S trace, we're using dash E this time. Option I didn't talk about last time. It actually is only going to print the system calls. For that system call that you specify dash E. So when a program runs like LS, it's actually going to open up a bunch of libraries it needs to actually get the function that it requires to run, right? So by default, this is what it runs. It runs, it looks in the LD.SO cache. This is the runtime linker cache in Linux. So this is the cache of where everything else should where all libraries should be found. And you can see it actually runs SC Linux.SO, 
It, it requires ECLHC with ECRE and a few other ones. And then it opens proc file system, and then it opens locale, a file for locale information. So that whenever you run it, it can print it based on your locality. Um, so in this case, uh, actually, I might be able to do something. I'm just thought. So user local. So we want to move. I don't want to break anything. So I'm going to break this up. So lib pcre. Uh, should I move that? Let's <laughs> see. Um, <laughs> move lib pcre or uh, lib. Wait, hold on. Let's use your local. Okay. So let's move lib x6 uh, lib pcre and we'll move that to user local lib. All right. So ls. Oh, I got to rebuild the cache. I think that's why it still works. Yeah, so we're going to LD config. When you run that command, it actually goes through all the paths for the libraries and builds the cache file for you. And dash V will actually show you each library's building and putting in the cache file in their location. So here's user lib, there's just straight up lib, and the other ones. So that one we were using was, like I said, good new. So let's actually just search. Let's go ahead and LD config dash V and then search for lib PCRE. Hopefully it won't be there. God damn it. You moved a different one. Oh, thank you. I didn't, thank you, thank you. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and do the reverse of this. I'm feeling so hard tonight. Why is it not I don't know. Anyways, okay, so I don't know where that is. I don't know what the hell that is, but we'll just start from scratch. So move uh, user lib x86, uh, and then we want to do uh, lib PCRE. And thanks for catching that. There's a few different ones. So why? Oops. Um, we want to do. PCR. Oh, it wasn't just for the next slide. All right, so there's the library located there. Oh, it is a symlink too. So it's a symlink to 3.1 or 13.1. And what we're going to do is we're going to move this library 1.3 to user local lib. Okay, now unless you fail. Yes. Is that what I wanted? So at this point in time, this is actually the error I had because it was for a different program, right? I said you couldn't find liblog more. So the runtime linker, not able to find it. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, damn it. I rebuilt the cache and I guess it found it because it's in a Bluetooth cache. Um, I shouldn't have done that. But you saw the error message. And <laughs> well, what we actually wanted to do is we want to run S trace, which is what I had to figure out where I was looking for the library. So first, before I do that, just go to S. So if this is where the runtime linker, those configuration files here, they tell where to look for files. So let's just do that grab user uh, local lib. Okay, so lib.c has that. So that's why we built the cache whenever I moved it. So let's actually comment that out. So. So this is this is important. So if you're ever actually working with libraries and it doesn't if their system doesn't know how to find them, this is exactly what you do. You just go in the directory in the runtime linkers configuration directory and you make sure the path is in one of these. And it tells you where to search for those particular libraries. Then when you're done editing it, you run LD config to rebuild the cache of the libraries. Now LS you failed, it did. So let's just take a look. Here's what I did the bug. So I didn't actually know ahead of time that you needed that in the uh, in the runtime linker path. So what I did was open ls. And you can see now, look at our output, it's a lot different. It's found these three, but everything after says enoent no such file or directory. So it actually, this is what actually happening. It's trying to run, it's trying to find libpcre for every path that's in those configuration files, one after another, and it doesn't exist. Eventually it tries all things and it's not going to work because, again, the library is not able to be loaded and it doesn't exist. 
So all I had to do was working with um, that program, Live by Sagan, is actually Live, live Long Arm. Was I had a, was like, once I saw that, I go, oh, it's not even looking in the right directory. It's like, I, I installed a user local live, but the S trace output shows actually not trying that directory at all. So that's why I didn't find it. Like, oh, well, I just need to add to the runtime. Oh, it's fun. Then these PCRE also. <laughs> Use that. <laughs> um, I'll just do something a little bit sooner. It's been a long time since I used that. Um, so user local live, and then we'll do uh, that's, that's actually pretty funny. All right, I'll okay. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're back working now. It's nice. So I don't even know if I could have done that with it anymore. Let's try it. Uh, or, and then E for edit? No. I need edit. I can't remember. Is it right? Uh, right saves the file. I know there's I and A for insert the file. Ah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and right. And then how do you quit? There we go. Let's see if it's right. Okay. Because um, for the you have to do like I enter and then you type what you want and then you hit period and then that exits out. Oh okay. Yeah, I don't remember yeah. this. Yeah. I had to use it once for the I think I told you about. I haven't used it since. I was just like messed up. That's funny. Okay, so anyway, that's one time we could have like right there. <laughs> Probably explained it pretty poorly because I kept screwing up. But so the type big talk is on uh, Linux kernel capabilities. So this is something I've, I've used in the past, but never really thoroughly, uh, fully understood until I started, uh, I shouldn't say fully now, but I have a much better understanding. So I was like, hey, I'm going to learn something new. A lot of people don't know about this, so let's learn before today's slide vlog, essentially. So um, capabilities are privilege sets, or they have, capabilities have privilege sets in the language kernel. So capabilities were designed to divide up the power of root into fine-grained controls. Instead of giving you control, a set user ID on a binary and having the ownership of the binary as root so that anybody that runs it, they become a, the effective user ID as root. Instead of giving them root powers, what you do is you divide up root and, and apply these fine game create controls to your particular programs. And there's two ways that it's been done. Um, earlier on, in earlier kernels, it was for threads. You actually had to make a system call to apply the capability to a process. But as of kernel 2.6.24, they applied the, they had a program that actually do file system capabilities. So what actually happens when you apply the capability to the program, they you basically just, you run the, the capability program and the binary, like user low, or, or slash bin ls, and you apply the capability to that program. What it actually does, it actually writes capability information to the inode structure. So um, you, can, you can do that with a tool that used to be the inodes. And that's how, that's how it's different. And the program doesn't actually need to set the capability. You don't have to be a programmer to want to edit your program just so you can run it at certain privileges, right? You can actually just apply it to the file system. In the kernel, whenever the program is run, the kernel, it will ask the kernel, or the kernel will actually check for what the capabilities are and then choose which one, see if they're allowed or not, and then run it. So for security, this is very important in Linux. Um, the other thing is uh, things of uh, root user bypasses all the capabilities, the checks. So if you're not a user, it doesn't really matter. But if you are a non-privileged user, uh, anything that is not uh, user ID zero, then you're actually uh, the kernel. Once you run the program, will actually check for those capabilities. So uh, the manual page for capabilities is man seven, or man seven capabilities. It's the manual. It's the manual section seven, and you can see there's a bunch of them. Each one is a specific kernel capability. And um, you can see here's one that, I, that you'll use if you work with packet sniffers or programs that need require uh, root access to actually maybe sniff raw sockets on a network interface or open a network interface and set it in promiscuous mode. Um, you actually need to have capnet raw set or you need to use sudo or you need to become root. Otherwise, you're not able to. But instead of giving someone sudo access and instead of making them root, we can divide the security up into these specific granular controls again. And so we can actually apply capnet raw to a binary, and then when you run that binary, it actually asks the kernel if you have permission for that, see that it does, 
and then it will run it so you can actually just use the privileges for that program that you set. Now, um, there's 36 Linux kernel capabilities at this point in time. Uh, there are a few tools that uh, you can use to actually get the kernel capabilities and set them if we're talking about file system capabilities. Remember, there's also a thread-based capability that if you're a programmer, you have to call a program system call. So first of all, the package on Linux for capabilities is called libcap. In Ubuntu, we can actually use app dash file list to actually see the contents of this. They actually have cap 2, so I guess version 2 probably or something. That's what they call it in their package. Okay, so I'm doing the contents of this particular package. You can see that you have a library, right? And then you have some programs that are in SBIN. So these are the programs that you actually use to check the capability set on your binaries. And capabilities only works on binaries, and the particular file. Um, since it works with inode, it uses an inode structure to actually contain the capabilities for it, you cannot use symlinks, for example, because that's a separate inode for the symlink, right? So um, what we're actually doing is we want to use get cap to set to get, to get the capabilities of the program, we use set cap to actually set them. And get pcap is another one, but difference this one is actually gets the capabilities of a running process. So um, we can actually check that. So I wrote this little for loop, and actually we'll, we'll get the running process and the printer capabilities. So you can see that we're using pgraph-f, and we're just matching all processes. So you can see that this is what this does. F is printed to the process ID. So it's printing all the processes running, simpler than uh, using PSAUX and then having to parse out the first column or something. I guess you can do the dash O, P2, but this is how I did it. So at this point, we're, um, we're going to run through, and for every process ID, we're going to look at get pcaps. And you can see at this point, Here's the capabilities for each one. So some of these, like this particular program, whatever the hell it is, has capabilities for binding, for network administration, for network raw, for a module. See, that's 418. So let's just look at that program, see what process that is, 418. And that's DH client. So it needs all those things, where it has to look on the interface, et cetera, for requests, et cetera, and responses. So, now we can see that even in default Linux, how important capabilities are that just a lot of programs use them by default. So they don't have to get the user root to be able to run them. So um, let's say check them. Another way we can do this, we use get, pack, get cap to actually do it for a file system capability, check it on the file system. So it's not clear at this point whether these capabilities are set through the program by a syscall or whether these capabilities are set in the file system by the inode structure. So uh, in this particular case, we're going to do get uh, pcap, and we're going to do which, or get cap, and which, and we'll do dh client. And oh, why is that? Oh, that's because that's set through the system call, I believe. That's why that didn't work. Interesting. Uh, let's try another one. Who would have um, get pcap, or get cap, let's do, uh, God damn it. Then ping. Nope. Let's set one though. So we'll go ahead and do set cap. We'll do cap net raw. Ping doesn't need this. Do EP. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, then ping. At this point, we'll do get ping. Now you can see that that one actually has the file system attributes, right? So what we've learned since get, get cap on. I'm just making this assumption. I haven't, I haven't actually read this or anything, but what it seems to me is that if, if you use the git cap and it's not going to on the file system attributes, I know structure, then it pretty much is, I think, in me implies that it was set through the system called that particular program. And actually, you know what? We can test that <laughs> with S trace. Because <laughs> S trace is the shit. Um, so, what is the system call for uh, cap or capability? Uh, can I Catch set. Get set capabilities with threads. So let's actually see if that does it. So what we're going to use is S trace dash E, cap set, and DH client. Oh, it's got a, it's got a, it's broken in place, I think. Yeah, that's fine. Um, the clock and child are exiting, so um, hold on. Ah, it's dying off real quick. Uh, so DH client dash R. I think. 
That's for a new, some of them bitch. I went to release it, I think. We're just gonna. Well, my serve system stopped responding. Uh, there you go, SSH. Let's see if I can get right there. On screen. Turn around. No. I wonder why that happened. Oh, I know. I'm an idiot. They have to page it to the box. Just, damn it. All right, so failures. All right, so what we're going to do is, uh, like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely feeling hard tonight. But that's okay. We'll learn it as we go. Um, we'll get back to that in a second. So while that's reloading, um, so there's two types of capabilities. Talk about. There's file system capabilities and there's thread based capabilities. And each capability, those types are called supersets. And each of those has three subsets underneath them. And they're called permitted, effective, inherited. And they actually have different meanings for each set, each superset. It's kind of complicated and I hate it, but um, it's how it is. We don't actually need to understand the, the differences. I'll show you the man page where you can read about them. Um, so essentially, in the thread, I, kind of, I remember the thread book is fairly easy. Uh, permitted, effective, the difference between the two is permitted actually has the list of the bitmaps of capabilities that are allowed, the program is allowed to use. The effective uh, set is the capabilities that when you run the program, they're going to be in effect. They don't actually, so essentially the permitted has to be there and then it has to be set in effective. But it, the reason you have two different ones is because you can actually not, you can actually turn it off with the system call so that it's still in permitted, but you're not actually utilizing it. So it's a way to drop and add these capabilities in your program. So that's why we have two separate sets, permitted and effective. So effective when they're in effect, permitted says so this is your baseline, you can only use these available. Um, So, so that's, that's kind of interesting. And then um, capabilities are disabled if LD underscore library underscore path is set. So that is a variable in your shell that, that tells you where to look for additional libraries, right? And the reason this is a security mechanism, if you can set LD library underscore path, you could then call your own libraries for things and not use the system libraries. So you can do malicious things. So if a program requires capabilities and that set it says no, this is no good, we're probably not going to attempt to do it anyway because this could be they could, a liquid attacker could be using a malicious library or something, calling their own, calling their own uh, functions and calls. So that's why it does not work. As soon as li library, uh, low library is set, or path is set, then it is disabled. Um, essentially, that's pretty much capabilities, but now I want to we got to talk about actually practical uses in just a moment. So, uh, can I get back in now? Yes, okay. So, um, let's find a program that's not, <laughs> that's not huge client. All right, so what is, uh, that's probably hit to, let's do something that's, oh, that's pretty much, you know, 1411. I'm guessing that's the East Point too. Uh, 1411, yep. Uh, uh, so I saw another one, 721, so 721, and that's RPC, yeah, I don't need that. Okay, cool. So we can actually use this one. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to, that D, yeah, I don't even know what that is. Okay, stop it. And then what we're going to do is, so um, stat D, so we're going to do uh, which stat D, make sure that we're actually using process capabilities or thread capabilities. Um, why did that not work? Oh, extend the oh, the result. So where the hell is that? E? It's not called that. So in the script, let's see. In that. And oh, it's format. Oh, format command. Right? Well, what the hell is that here? Jesus H. Christ, what is this one? Oh, there's more than we so, um, SMFI. Is that right? Exec R oh R there it is. Jerk and jerk. All right, so yes. All right, so when you get cap, right, and we want to do S bin RPC, 
and nothing, right? So now we're going to S trace it, and what we're going to do is use, I um, don't remember what that was, cap set, right? Cap set, yes, cap set. So we're going to use uh, S trace, look for the cap set system call only, and then S bin the RPC. Step D, and what is that exit? Um, Hmm. Well, maybe I'm, oh, wait, it's on the score here, right? That's what's going on. PKL, RPC, that stat D, it's kind of brain. All right, so uh, let's actually do it again. It works. I'm expecting this to work. If it doesn't, we're going to do it. Uh, cap sets and RPC, that stat D. And again, I need to add the F option so that it looks like it can analyze this for us. Ah, yes, perfect. Okay. So I, so here we actually prove that's what that's how it's getting its capabilities, right? It's calling this is called uh, cap set. So I'm going to typically have long. And then it's passing all these parameters to the system call. You can see it's setting each one, uh, which is what you'll get. Um, so now let's actually use some, or talk about something. So TCB dump, perfect example. You want to you want to allow your user to run TCB dump on your on your system, right? You don't want to give them root though, because to run TCB dump in promiscuous mode requires a bind to a pay a packet socket. So that requires root. So in this particular case, on root, I can run TCP up. Great. On not root, I can't run TCP up. Well, I just need a special option in this case. And I don't have permission to capture that device, right? So how can I how can I fix this? How can I how can I allow my user just to do TCP up, have privileges, special privileges for that, and no other program? Well, I can use sudo or I can use capabilities. Let's take, uh, take advantage of capabilities because they're more fine great. And in this particular case, what we're going to do is we're going to set capability cap net raw plus EP. In this case, these are required. You have to, so, the e, so this is the EPI, those three capabilities that I talked about. E is for effective, P is for permitted, I is for inherited. We only need effective and permitted in this particular case. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to apply it to the TCB dub binary. It should be, nope. User SPIN TCB dub? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to apply it to the binary. Okay. Now we're going to do cap user SPIN TCB dump and verify results. And you can see that the capability is now set. Now what we're going to do is we're going to drop off, become the standard user who could not use TCB dump before, and try it now. And now that user can use TCB dump, right? So it's the yeah, curl capabilities are pretty sweet. And I can tell you, um, Using, using um, and this is good to know too, Waylon, for uh, Islet and Docker, is that when you're doing capabilities, uh, like for, for Brocon, we did sudo at first. It was, a, it was just kind of, it's kind of get up, giving people access to go to the uh, bro binary. We limited the binary, what that means they can use the exec uh, function to actually run the program stuff as root. So you actually eventually ran capabilities inside Docker. So you tell Docker, hey, I want to add a capability to the container. And by, by default, Docker drops capabilities. It only has a set number that are actually enabled and drops the rest of them for security concerns. And what you can do is you have to tell Docker, well, I want to enable netcat raw for this, for we use bro, for example. So brocon for our, our particular image, we had to set net, we had to set cap, uh, netcat raw on the bro binary so the users could then not become root in the container, but they could just run bro as a local standard user. And let's actually just go quickly to uh, an example of that. We have Docker files here. And we want to go to bro and Docker file. And at right here, this last line of the Docker file, set cap, we're actually giving bro set net, set net, or cap net raw and cap net admin. And we're sending it to the bro binary, right? So that way the users don't have to become root in the container. But this, by the default, if you just do this, it will not work because remember, Docker drops the privileges. And if you try to run that program after, it will fail. This goes back to the uh, the, the Docker portion of the um, or the container city uh, meeting section. You have to specify prior to writing the container dash dash cap add dash dash cap drop for which capabilities you need, and then once you're in the container, you set to the binaries. Um, so. With this, while I was doing this research for this talk, I was like, 
wouldn't it be really cool to add an easy way for Islet to support all these capabilities? So Islet's that training system software I wrote. Um, Islet now has support for six, or all 36 Lynx kernel capabilities in a yes or no format. So let's go to commit. I did this two days ago. Uh, config file toward the bottom, I think. Yeah, here it is. So at this point in Islet, that we don't check that. It's one of the new features in Islet. Uh, so now there's a new configuration file in the SD Islet directory called security.com. And you can just set your kernel capabilities right here so that when you run the container, it automatically applies it. So if you don't want people in the container to be able to use nice access to raw I.O., for example, you just set these to no, no access to syslog, all that they, they cannot run kernel modules or they cannot insert their own. So you have fine grained computing. Uh, configuration tuning over 36 links kernel capabilities now. So that's pretty sweet. And so, okay, so there's 36 capabilities, right? Are those extensive of all the things you would possibly need to root for a program to run? No, I don't believe so. I don't know the answer to that, but no, I don't think so. I looked through the list and I can, I can see where there might, some of them are real specific. Like, um, like if you want to edit your own text file, you couldn't use the capability for that unless you apply like some this capability to them, for example, to actually open the text file and write to it, right? Because you're evaluating or, or escalating privileges there. But there's nothing for that in here, I don't think. Okay. Well, let's just go through a few of them just to give an idea, a better idea. Um, in those cases, where there is, sorry, pardon me, you know, you're um, where there is, um, where you don't think there's a capability for what you need, I would just use sudo and specify the that you can configure sudo to only to limit to the binary and even the arguments to the binary, so that only the user can use that binary with sudo if he specifies this particular argument. So you can go that low and that's the granular that you can do that. So let's take a few look at them though. So. Um, Capcham, make arbitrary changes to file user IDs and group IDs, right? Uh, cap audit write, write records to kernel auditing log. Oh, this brings up a point. So in opening a stem, Dustin and Weber made a point about using audit D and containers to get information on the system. Well, you can actually drop those privileges using cap underscore audit, uh, control and write, so that uh, I believe this thing will be vulnerable to what he was talking about. Uh, in our, in our opening the but we're talking about containers. But, uh, so that's the capability there. Also, um, F owner, so this bypass permission checks for following user IDs. Uh, you can, the user can then, if the binary has it, the binary can run with the uh, set extended file attributes and you like apply it to uh, CHATTR, for example, um, et cetera, et cetera. Lock memory, kill. This was an interesting one, and we can actually try this one. You set cap kill and then the, any user to kill a process. Well, let's just do that one right now, just because it's an easy example. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to come in. Okay, you become a root to set the capability, of course. So, um, uh, so we're going to do set cap, set cap, and we're going to say cap kill, and then we're going to do EP, and then we're going to say slash bin kill. Well, first, I want to show you that I cannot kill the process required. I know this, but just for demonstration purposes. So I want to kill this VBON service. N93 joining its root. I'm not root. I cannot kill it. Operation 9, obviously, right? So we're going to become this. And now at this particular point in time, we're going to set that. And what is that? Uh, set cap, uh, cap kill plus EP. So effective and permit events. And then we're going to do spin kill and get cap. We can verify it. All right, boom. At this point, this user, I'm not going to kill that server because that has to do with my virtual machine. I don't want to do that to happen. So I'm going to kill another process. Let's do our, uh, well, that'll work too because it's not on my main. Yeah, let's just do uh, RPC binding be fine. So that's root process right here at 695. Kill 695. And kill. Hmm, right in that one. 695. Huh, I don't want to do more. I swear you, I did this the other night. Do I have my history still? I'm going to type something wrong. Maybe I have a special setting. Uh, 
Oh, I'm going to some of you guys. Yeah, you need a huge school bag. I know, I know. I said, I said it's a huge amount. Uh, it's, per, it's perfect for case like, Okay, so here's what I was working on last slide. Or not last slide, even though I was working on this. I think you know, this is the last slide. Nope. Uh, oh, I did it so that you can use the S trace too. Hold on, I want to I show that example as well. There we go, cap kill. So here it is, cap kill. Okay, so bin kill. Yeah. All right, so I'm looking for a process or a pit for that. ATD, so I use 11473. I killed that. Oh, wait, okay, I got it. You have to use the full path in this case. Okay, process is going to be so Because um, it has to do, I believe, with the inode. You can only use the full path in this particular case. Wait, I thought that was the, then the bytes were written on the inode, but you still. Um, I well, actually, I see what you're saying. Um, I guess I don't know. I was thinking that's what I was thinking of the top of my head. Because um, we did. So it's not a post entry sign. Find out. Yeah. Beautiful. Please show all of you. Great. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, just Brian or I disregard what I said it was stupid. <laughs> I don't understand what it means for it to be a shell built in though. That means that bash contains the contains like oh. a version of of kill, I guess. So okay. Something that can do the equivalent of kill. Okay. You know, there's a lot of bash built in uh, to make it faster, so you don't actually have to run all these programs. Another good thing is you don't have to hash them or anything. Right. And the shell can handle it for you if you don't have them on your system, because not every system has a particular one. So I'm looking at some of the capabilities on the machine, and it seems that you can only assign like EP bits for everything the same. Or at least there's no examples where some are EP and some are EPL or whatever it is. They're all EP at your machine? Like uh, you have a long list of capabilities for a certain process, and then you only have one set of those of those bits. I'm just gonna Yeah. So I guess I, I I don't know if that's just a necessary. Like you have a long list oh, for that was huge. And, yeah. and it's just what one set of those bits. Is it possible to set different sets or is that just Oh yeah, yeah. So you can you can do like if you want to add I in there for inheritable mm -hmm. set, then you apply so look, this effective and permitted bits are set for all those capabilities that he's mm -hmm. he's putting in there. So yeah, you can set different ones. For for subsets of the of the capabilities of a process. Oh, I see. You mean to have like one capability this particular set and another capability this set? Actually, no, no, let's find out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, so yeah, so that works for, okay, that explains why that is. Good thing you, I'm glad you, I had no idea kill was built in. Yeah, there's a lot of weird ones. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? All right, um, is there a way to do built list all the built ins? Uh, well, there's like I know there's a built-in called built-in, so maybe built-in <laughs> has a. Um, yeah, I, I have no idea. Okay, yeah, I'll look up like I'm sure there's a way to do it. Um, what's I doing? Oh, yeah, you want to you want to set uh, capabilities? Let's do. I guess one way to do it, you could you could uh, empty your path and then just have complete. That might work. For, uh, well, that's a good idea too. I'll try it a second. Um, so we're doing cap, net and raw, and let's do cap, kill, right? And we're going to use a different set here. We're going to use EIP, right? So that, I think that will test what we want to test. That only needs to do there. Oh, yeah, I'm, oh, yeah, I do, yeah, I'm, I'm a regular user. Nope, that's invalid. You can't do that, it looks like. All right, let's make sure we're going to have some formatting issue. No? Let's try it. Let's do it. Let's do it a little differently. Let's do uh, that, and then then let's do another one after and see what happens. Um, kill plus EIP, right? User S bin TCP dump. Hit cap user S bin TCP dump. Nope. Looks like you can't. It just takes the last one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's actually, yeah, that makes sense. I think about it, they're all masked together. So I think that makes sense why why that's the case. Um, 
Okay, so the other cool one was the P trace one. So we talked about S trace, right? So let's go ahead. Oh, by the way, to remove capabilities, you use dash R. And you say, hey, I want to remove capabilities on this file. You can't remove specific ones. You have to do the whole thing, otherwise it fails. So watch. Let's try this test. So I'll remove net, cap, raw. Go ahead and interview that. So that fails. But if I remove this, or I even add this, it fails. But if you just do nothing, it works. So you actually cannot specifically remove particular ones because of the masking, I guess. It doesn't actually recalculate or anything. Um, so the last thing I want to do is the P trace, which is cool. And I can actually just go up to my huge ass scroll buffer and find it. And let's do, uh, what's it, control Yeah, control it. Yeah, I want to do uh, uh, cap P trace. Cap. Work. Oh, CSV trace, my bird. Okay, so I'm just going to search for uh, cap CSV trace. Hey, John. I've opened that file so many times. One second. There it is. Okay, what? Uh, it's pretty much unrelated to the last meeting. So I'm still toying around with little things you talked about and open it with them because for the Bro Intel generator, did you get HTML to text work on your Mac? Yeah. That a package? Yes, but the reason it doesn't work is his script only tested for one location. And it's actually not in the location where it's telling it tests for. So you just have to I'm gonna I'm, I wrote a patch for him and send it to him, but okay. just change if you want to change it real quick, uh, you can look for the condition so dash F where the file exists. If you open up the shell script, you can just match that ACL up to text. Just search for that in there, and you can just replace it with your path that it's installed in. Or you can do like which, you know, you, uh, expansion, do which and that, but find it wherever it is. Okay. Um, okay, so in this particular case, was demo. I'm a, a normal user, right? And I want to run S trace against a process that's owned by root and it tells me that I cannot attach that problem. You don't want to be able to you write on a system and you normally you should not be able to attach to root process, especially uh, because a process could have passwords or something in them or something important, uh, among other things. So it fails. But if you use set cap, cap sys p trace, by the way, uh, the lowercase and uppercase are similar in this case, you can use the set cap to get this way either one. Um, and then for S trace, I log back out and then I run S trace as the normal user again, the bigger user, for that same process. In this particular case, I'm able to attach to it, right? And I can see the system call and it executes. So um, it's sweet. Uh, Lucian, you missed last time. I want to show you a first example of uh, something fun uh, for security uh, with S trace. So we're going to, uh, we did S. Uh, Brian missed it too. You left. Yeah, you were, we were talking late. Okay. So um, so S trace, right? So you run S trace and then the program after, and it just it, it basically gets you every system call. That's what it is. It's a system call trace. It gets every single one and prints it. So basically, when you run S trace, it attaches to the kernel. It oh, it uses a feature in the kernel called P trace. It sets that bit so that then when that bit is set, every time you enter a system call, the trace is record or the what you're System call is recorded every time you leave the system call. The result is recorded so that you actually get the error code and everything. You get the return value, and that's what everything is on the right. The, all the four eight, the four zero. Uh, I don't know. That's one thing I know. I said I've never been able to find an answer to is color coding your mouse so that on the terminal you can see it. So all these are zero exit codes for those particular uh, system system, uh, system calls. So, um, so what's a fun one? Password is a fun one, right? So we can actually use S trace to write out to a file, but we're going to do that. Let's just do password. So uh, we're going to change the password of the vagrant user. Okay, so it tries to load all the library, right? And then what it does at the top, we're not going to up there, but then it tries to open um, all kinds of locale information, right? So Linux PAM uh, locality information here, uh, Unicode, all the stuff that it needs to properly display your to terminal. And then what actually happens is, it asks us to enter a password. And actually, right now, we're stuck on the password prompt. And you can see it opens the right system call to enter a new Unix password and actually put it up on the screen. So this one hasn't finished it. So when S trace hasn't finished, it's waiting us for an input. It just pauses there. So it's going to read in the file script from zero what you're the password. Some type of my password. 
Okay, so now you can see they got it, took that, and it put it, now it's asking to retype the password, so my password again. And then I just changed the password, and uh, it printed all that information on the screen. So at this point, what system call, does anybody know what system call in, that's used to actually read in from the, from the, from the screen? It's in the name, there is a sentence, I just said. Yes, read, woo! So what we're going to do is, we can actually narrow down this. It says trace dash E, password again, I'm oh, sorry, to only print read the expressions to match that password for vagrant. And at this point, it's just got the read ones out. And we're going to do password again. And we're going to do um, stuff. And at this point, if you're S tracing, look, you've actually got the password. So, yeah, if, you can, if you can trace this program, you can actually see that the password was, this is why the password I sent to the resystem system call. So that's kind of cool. I just thought that was interesting. Cool. So, um, and then the other thing is, it actually shows you that it, uh, when it opens up, we're missing the far score, actually it's opening, it's opening up the uh, shadow file, right, to change it. And what's actually doing is, it's uh, recalculating the hash. So this right here, um, let's just look for it open. I think, I think it's open. Uh, yeah, right, yeah, so open shadow for read only here, but we want it to, should be read write or something. Password, shadow, I don't know what clone exec is. But anyways, write only. I wonder what end shadow is. Actually, I have no idea what that is. What's that called end shadow? Oh. Five. In shadow. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I have to look that what the hell in shadow is. I'm going to do it. That's interesting. But anyway, it actually has to write to the shadow file, obviously, if someone changes the password. So you can actually see it whenever we look at the, the previous one with. Um, it's actually. Uh, I don't mouse. Can't see it again. So this is the actual. In the shadow file, there's three fields for the password. And the first field is the algorithm. And dollar sign six means SHA 256. The second dollar sign over is um, assault, and the third one is the encrypted password. And S trace, you can see how we don't actually get the full system call. It does the three dots, and stays continued. With S trace, you can actually print more of it, though, using the dash S option. So if you want to get 256 bytes, for example, or 500, it will actually print the rest. So the lines are longer. So you do that. So S trace, you specify a command to run and then trace to it. But is there a way to tra to trace an already running process? Good question. Uh, yes, S trace. Uh, ooh, screw up my S trace uh, dash p. So let's look for process. S trace on root, so we can trace. Should we trace anything? Let's trace uh, each client. For, so dash p fourteen one one. I'm attached right now. Okay, cool. And you can see it's just it's waiting for a select because it keeps looping for you know the address and what it has to do that. So can you S trace itself? Yes. <laughs> that is a really good question. Yes. So you can actually learn how S trace works <laughs> by S tracing S trace. <laughs> so let's do it because it's cool. And I keep getting four or threes on the Git repos. Which ones? Uh, pretty much all of them. I mean, I mean, like GitHub or our personal Git server. Oh, yeah. yeah. How are you? Oh. Give me just a second. Can you see what the remotes are? Type git remote dash d or git space dash remote or git space remote space dash d. Um, yeah. Oh, you're using. Well, oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to get. Uh, well, I'll be just saying. So yeah, so at this point we're actually looking at S, we're S tracing S trace, and what we should oh wait, do we fail here? Yes, because we have to S trace something else. <laughs> so we're going to actually need to do F because we're going to be forking, right? <laughs> forking the LS anyway. So uh, we want to look for uh, P trace. So P trace. Okay, so P trace is the system call that you use. To uh, what S, S called S trace set, so that they can actually allow you to work with uh, get the information from the system call from the kernel. So you can see how it's used. P trace, the PID, etc. 
So we can, we're going to actually look for that. So we're going to do P trace, or dash S trace, B trace, and then you can actually see if we have a bunch of syscall or P trace calls, right? To actually get that information from the S trace process. I don't know. If, I guess we don't actually need that for that particular case. Oh, you can't do that anyway. P trace me operation up a minute. Okay, so I can't do the fourth thing. I don't know why, but. Yay! So, all right, so we got capabilities and we got S trace again. Yay. That's pretty cool. So, I mean, it's real cool for doing things like um, malware analysis, right? If you want to see what piece of Linux malware does, you're on S trace to do all the system calls. You can, like, find out what files it opens, find out what files it writes to while looking for the right system call, for example. Awesome. Or whatever. Is that, the, is that the right? Is right right to files as well? I don't know. I'm not sure. Whatever. Oops, wrong. Right. Uh, seven? No, four system calls. Two. Yep. Right to a file descriptor. Okay, yeah, that works. Right to a file descriptor. So that could be a file. All right. Um, so, anything, so that pretty much covers S or the Linux kernel capabilities, which is the sheet. Um, we'll quickly go through. I can just talk about if you want to find out the difference between the masking, which is more complicated. It is complicated, uh, at least for me, uh, but it's probably it's more than you really need to know anyway if you're just an admin, probably, in most cases. Maybe not all the cases. But uh, so you want to go to sets. Let's look for sets. Oh, that's too many matches. I forget what it was called. I was a search for. File capabilities and thread capabilities. That's what they are. So search for thread capability. All right, so here we are. So this explains permitted, inheritable, and effective. And then for the file ones, experience the permitted, inheritable, and effective. Because I said they're different for each one. So I actually don't understand the permitted, inheritable. I read it a few times and I'm just like, ah, I don't get it. I just gave up. I didn't care about it much. So. You know, I was interested in looking at it. Also, you actually, to be able to use the file capabilities, there actually has to be a capability set called set and cap. So just be aware of that. That's not actually enabled, uh, enabled to use it. But what I'm guessing right now is that when you run set cap, it actually said set as cap. <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> uh, try it. Uh, so S trace, because S trace is fine. Uh, net or er. Cat net raw. Let's pick on PC like again. Computer has spin. PC is out. So what we're looking for, we're looking for um, cap set, right? Dash E cap set. Yep. Oh, we can look at that. We get everything as fast to it. And you can see, look at the very end, set S cap. Yay. Cool. Are there any security concerns with using the, uh, the file superset instead of the system? Um, what I know of? Uh, well, uh, you can't, one thing is you cannot drop, from, you can't do dropping from the, uh, the file system once, right? Because you run the processors in the iNote, like, oh, yeah. you can't drop your privileges from there. Yeah. Plus, one difference that may be a concern if you have a program is that the thread ones are able to drop it. Um, so they can become root for a particular task and then drop it after. So that's kind of maybe a security concern. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know of any others. Not to say that there isn't. I'm sure there are, but uh, my knowledge is not exist. So there might be something to look into, though. Yeah. And to read more about I know. Yeah. What well, do you know if there's a tool in Linux that you can view the entire uh, I know structure that's in the base? I know you can probably do a sleuth, we can do a sleuth kit I know tools, but I can't. Can't think of any? I can't. Oh, I can't? Yeah. Is that for a sleuth kit? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, I was wanting something in the base, base system. Uh, so that, I can install it real quick. Is it a package for a sleuth kit? Yeah. Let's take a look at that. What is sleuth kit? Wayland? It's a set of forensic tools. Um, the bread and butter of it is um, like viewing stuff in the file system level. So there's some stuff in there that would allow you to parse the master file table out 
and actually do an install form. Um, you can also view partition information. So if you use a utility called MMLS, uh, if you run that against a raw image, it would show you the uh, hexadecimal locations for a raw partition structure. And then you can uh, do things like pull acquisitions and analyze the hang of structure for certain things. Oh, do, do I have to run this on an image? It looks like I do. I was hoping I, basically, I just want to, okay, so I got, here's the IO of TCP down. I just want to be able to print the entire structure. You know if you can do that without an image? I can't, because it looks like every image is a requirement here. I was looking for something. Later. I've always I, had an image. <laughs> that's fair. I, I, was, I was looking for a solution to it the other night, but. I you need an image? Huh? Do you need an image? No, I just want to do it. I want to do it on my host system so I can like just, just check out what we talk about what an inode looks like, for example. Just to, oh. we want to see those capability bits set in the inode. I don't know. No, so, I mean we can, we'll figure something out. Maybe we'll find. I mean, you could uh, you could create one real quick. Create what? A, a small image file with ED. You wanted to? Okay. Or we can do it another time. Right. Do you can do you off top of your head? Uh, I think D uh, if oh yeah, it's a problem for you. Equals you have to make one or give it something that's already on your dev null or dev zero. It's gotta be yeah. I mean, it's gotta have substance to it. it can't just be dev null. Well, I, I, I mean, dev random or dev random. Yeah, I've said dev null as as the yeah. Oh, okay. I said zero after. Oh, this one, sorry. Uh, this is just two TCP. That's me and TCP file. And then, yeah. and then just output file OF equals my dub. And then, do anything special? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess you could specify a box size if you wanted. Just do like DS equals. Uh, yeah. I don't know if this is, oh, okay, so. And then I think you could just run, uh, it's just, I, well, I think you can just run ICAT or MMLS against that image file. That's the same exact thing. Uh, oh, so it's a major No, we'll try that. Uh, and then now this I know that this is different though. So let's do I know. Wait, you said what was the other tool? And then MMLS and then dump wide up. Oh, uh, can I determine partition type? Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's what I have at this point those are the exact same files though. So I have another image you could use. But I can't push the repositories. <laughs> uh, well we will figure out another time. Boy, we'll save it. Maybe you can figure out tools to do it. I can yeah. do this for one of the you know, SM talks next month. Okay. Yeah, I just want to see uh, what the capabilities look like in talk this iNode structure. Why isn't that easier to get? Man dash K iNode, maybe? See if there's something built in. What are you trying to do? Just let's look at the iNode structure. Oh, iStaff? And then metadata structure? Was that was that part of Sukit? Yes. But you need an image in this case here. Okay. What is the K flag in man? Um search, uh, it's it's same as apropos. It just searches it searches the manual page. Okay. So instead of just loading a uh, man I know, it's actually having a searching for all the descriptions that match the word I know. It's just descriptions, right? Not actual content. Right, it's just it's just description. So, and it's just to verify that. Um, I guess you had to be in the I saw at the top. You can see it says apropos. So yeah, the other Linux tool does same, same thing. Um, uh, looks like it's the, you can use the long, could be long format. So cool to apropos searches the short manual page based on the descriptions for keywords. But you can also do this and do uh, I know for example, do this exact same thing. So speaking of that, is that a link? Oh. 
which uh, type apropos is hash, okay? Apropos. That's a link to what is. <laughs> Uh, what is what? What is the left? <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to say? They're different though, right? I mean, is, is it just using the executable name? Because like, doesn't doesn't what is only search the... Uh, what is database? Or like, the, it only searches the name of the... the oh, I'm sorry, that's where is. That's the where is database. Um, I don't actually know. Let's find out. You know what I'm saying, right? Descriptions like isn't what is different from apropos? Because doesn't what is only search like the name of the binary, not like the description? Is that right? Well, and they're the same though, because at least on Ubuntu, there's the the sim link from apropos was what is. Well, some utilities work by they just get the name of the executable and they change it. That is actually yeah, that's true too. So I okay. That. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so let's do. Um, Display what line manual page descriptions. All right, so if any name matched, right? Manual page names. Okay, so it matches on the name. You're right. And the question, the other question was matched with what does apropos do? Um, that searches the, the description. Oh, you're you're absolutely right. Thank you. So despite the name, sound like they do different. Good point on that. Yeah, so how does that work? It's, uh, I, it gets like the um, in the C stuff, so I don't know. Is it like it's using the exec or something? It's like in Bash if you were to get like, you know, like dollar sign zero. Like you get the name of the script. And it's like, oh, if it's this, then I, I act this way. And right. if my name is this, then I act this way. What's S trace? <laughs> so uh, S trace, what is, and then we'll do uh, LS. And hopefully, we want to. So we want to see. Ah, it is exact. Well, yeah. And Why didn't you use a dash e flag for this one? Because I don't know what system call to look for. But I'm not real sure like, what would be best. Does it just dash e search for a specific system call? Yeah. So. Um, Hold on, no. Uh, exec right here? Well, that's actually because I think it loads that what is ls. So let's just do what is by itself. And oh, it's probably good to know. No, that is a, no, that's not. Uh, hold on. So um, S trace writes its output to standard error. So you'll have to redirect it. So if I do this, Nothing, right? It's already just SDL. So you actually have to redirect just to be aware of that. Um, so exec. Oh, yeah, so I used the exec. So let's just, just to make sure I'm not stupid or anything, let's do uh, this. No, I use exec too. So I guess they all, oh, why don't you just bash use exec? Never mind. Okay, I was hoping that would have something to do with it. Um, yeah, as for what system call that will help us to uh, figure this out, I don't know. Um, so what is it doing? It has to open up. It would be, yeah, what would it be? It would be the, uh, whatever arguments are passed to test it. And that, is that may not even a system call. It might be a function. I don't know. I don't really know about the program shit, but I'm learning. Love it, sweet. Let's go down further. So at this point, we're, what are we doing? Manual config. Oh, okay. So this is where this is where um, what is this for me? It's we're looking through the it's opening all the files in the manual database or manual pages. So we need to start uh, something prior. Uh, what we need to do, I think, is we need to correct for um, what is. Nope. Prep for apropos. Nope. Well, the thing is, apropos calling what is not the other way around. Ah, that's right. Well, guys, at this point, I don't really know what to do. So, don't you want to be tracing apropos and searching for what is? Oh. 
So Let's see if you find anything for what it is. So, what is, well, yeah, you're right. Start for what it is. Okay, so it's done. All right, user van. Okay, so we access that file. It's not there. Read in what is, what is. That's not helpful. I wonder if it actually happens like not in a piston call, but in a normal, like some function, right? Yeah. And then it wouldn't show it. Yeah, I'm not programming it. I don't know how that is. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I know it's a thing. Well, how about one of us look it up for the next meeting so we can talk about it? Okay. That'd be really sweet. Um, Would you want to be interested in taking on that? Sure, if I run it. Yeah, so there's another uh, program called uh, LTrace. And that actually does functions. Oh. Uh, I've never used this one though. I'm actually let's try it. Oops, I'll try this. Oh, look at there. Oh, let's see, star. So let's yeah, man, that's pretty sweet. Um L trace apropos. L S. Oh dear God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's start with let go to let's see if we have this. No, okay, so that goes to uh SD group two. And then you want to do um and I don't give you a thousand. Oops. Hopefully it's somewhere within a thousand. I'll try to learn how to learn L trace for the next meeting, I think. Wow, this is really ugly. Can you convert that to whatever it is? Or is it? Yeah, that's there's gotta be a way to convert that from the text. Uh ASCII text. Let's see what it is. Yeah. Well, okay. well, I'll save it for another time. Yeah, I don't really want to know how that works. Yeah, I, I feel weird talking about it because, like, I, it's never something I've read about it, just sort of something I noticed, and I'm like, sort of explored a little bit, I guess, because, like, I noticed a lot of things work that way. Yeah, I. I I've noticed that too, but I guess I've never really thought about it. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, well, I don't know. I guess the first thing, because I'm, I'm like a VIM nerd, I guess the first thing I think I noticed it with is how, uh, what is it? I think, I think VIM is similar to VIM that time. How the hell does that work? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Like that. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think grip's the same way with the F grip and E grip. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, let's do that. Uh, no, that one's just wait, why is that uh oh the hell? Nope. I thought they were. Yeah, I thought they were too. Oh, this is BSD two, so they're gonna be different. Um, let's try here. Okay, well, I guess they're not. Oh yeah, that was the way, actually, I remember this. I was I was actually looking at the same thing, and I was like, why are these all like huge executables? Like why did they, if Grep already has the option to do that, it's weird that they do it like that. Right. But maybe, who knows, maybe Grep dash, you know, capital F calls the F Grep. That's, I honestly have no idea. I want to some hand page about that. Pretty closely.
I'm pretty sure. Okay, so yeah, I, I did like a, I did a diff on the binaries, and they're all different, and they were slightly different sizes, but they were different. Okay. Yeah. Um, link to change. How do you word that? Change. I mean, because really it's not that it's a sim link, I think that it's just the name, it's the name. Like if you were to change the executable name, or the actual binary name, I think it would actually change it as well. So it's, I mean. Oh, it's, so it's that's a stored in, in argument zero. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think it just, I think in the program there's just a check, there's a case, or there's a switch or something for argument zero, and then, you know, do. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I wish you knew how to use a debugger right now. Yeah. That makes Efficiently, yeah, we're going to be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be loading GDP pretty soon here. Um, test argument zero. Well, that concludes one. I'm going to go ahead and stop the video. All right, thanks for attending here, right? We'll follow up next week here. Stop sharing. And